Hi, I'm Carson, and I'm going to tell you about high dimensional structure of signal and noise in 20,000 neuron recordings. So now in mice, we can record tens of thousands of neurons simultaneously. And I'll tell you in this talk how we, how we obtain these recordings and also how we analyze this data and come to scientific conclusions with this large scale data. So to perform large scale recordings in mice, we use a microscope that can sample the brain very quickly at many depths. So here's an example of a recording with 12 planes and we are able to sample at a rate of 3 hertz. And these mice also genetically express a protein that lights up when the neurons fire, and that's how we're going to capture this, this activity in images. So you'll see in this video here, it's going to start zooming out from a single plane recording, and you'll see the neurons blinking as they fire. And the type of microscope we use to record this large-scale activity is relatively common, but when we did these recordings there didn't exist a pipeline to quickly and accurately extract thousands of neurons from these recordings. Most of the time neurons were extracted in manual matters by drawing circles for instance on these on these images. So we created a pipeline called Sweet2P which allows us to quickly and accurately detect neurons in these recordings. So each of these neurons is a little circle here in, in a different color. And then the activity of a neuron is defined basically as the sum of the pixels on every single frame in their little circle. And that, that sum of pixels increases when the neuron is, is lighting up There's a higher when there's higher firing. And then that gives us traces across time of how bright a neuron is in its little disk. And that's what these traces are down here. So we have, we're, we're, we have 10 to 20,000 of these traces for every single recording that we do. And what were the scientific conclusions we were able to, to come to? One is that we found that spontaneous behaviors such as running and whisking and grooming and other things the mouse does uh, drive multidimensional brain-wide neural activity. So areas like visual cortex and thalamus and hippocampus and all these different brain regions are driven by the behavior that the mouse is performing at any given time. The, the second finding uh, we discovered was that there is high precision coding in mouse visual cortex. So even though there's these behavioral representations going on in visual cortex, the, the brain is still highly precisely coding external stimuli, visual stimuli, it, and we're able to decode that activity at very high accuracy. And then finally, we, we looked at the dimensionality of neural responses to visual stimuli, and we found that the, this dimensionality was high in mouse visual cortex. So first I'll tell you about the, the first piece of work about spontaneous behaviors driving multidimensional brain-wide neural activity. So when you close your eyes, your neurons don't just turn off, they keep firing. And we don't know what this firing is. It could be your innermost thoughts. You could be, it could be noise. It could be that you're predicting future things that are going to happen in your environment. Um, it could be uh, representing uh, motor signals. And so we have all this ongoing activity in our brains, and so do mice. So we're going to look at this ongoing activity in mice. And here's an example of, of, a, re of a recording of, of that activity when the mouse is sitting in the dark. And Unfortunately, when we do these large-scale recordings, we're doing them in mice, not in humans, so we can't ask them what they're thinking about, but we can look at their behavior while we're doing these recordings. So here's what the behavior of this mouse looks like simultaneously with the recording. And what you might see is that there's lots of different patterns of neurons lighting up here. It doesn't look just like a single one-dimensional signal that all the neurons are lighting up together. And there's lots of different behaviors that the mouse is doing. And previous work has shown that there are, that's, that one-dimensional signals like running uh, drive neural activity in visual cortex. And so they, they could explain one dimension of the variability in, in visual cortex. But we, we, we found that neural activity is, in fact, high-dimensional in, in ongoing activity. Uh, which I'll show next. So we also need then a multi-dimensional representation of behavior, which I'll also show how we extract that. 
and then we connect the two to each other and and find that we can predict around a third of, of visual cortex activity using behavior. So I'll show you that multidimensional, uh, that ongoing neural activity is multidimensional. And you can't tell from this plot, but I'll, I'll change it around in a second. So you have, here we're making a raster plot of neurons by time. So each of these rows is a single neuron's uh, activity, and these white, white means that it's firing. And now you can't see anything because there's no sort of apparent uh, structuring to the way that we've sorted these neurons along this axis. But say we put neurons that were correlated to each other next to each other, then you might start to see some structure in this raster plot. And in fact, we have an algorithm that, that does this, that puts correlated neurons next to each other to start to see structure in these large scale recordings called raster map, which you can download if you're interested. And, and this is, um, and with this approach, you can start to see that there are indeed multiple different patterns of activity in mouse visual cortex. It's not just a, a single dimensional, uh, a low, a single dimension of variability going on. All right. So to explain multiple dimensions of variability in, in the activity, we are going to need multidimensional predictors. So we're going to take our behavior and, and have a multidimensional representation of that too. So we have a video of the mouse face across time. So we have many of these frames and we're going to take the difference between frames because we care about behavior. So we care about what's moving. So in this example, you can see the whiskers are moving. And then this is going to be a million pixels by many time points. So we also reduce the dimensionality of this using PCA. And then we get something, the spatial components of the PCs look, look something like this. We're calling them mouse eigenphases. And you can start to interpret these. PC1 looks a bit like full motion of the whole face. PC2 looks a bit like whisking. And then PC3 looks more like the mouse is sniffing in this region here. So now let's try to predict the neural activity using these multidimensional behavioral readouts. So we have these, these motion energy PCs, and we're going to use them to predict the neural PCs. And we take 500 motion energy PCs and we take 1,000 neural PCs. So this is still, a, if we want to just predict using linear regression, this is still a pretty big uh, matrix of coefficients to predict, and we might be prone to overfitting. Also, if we just use linear regression to, to perform a prediction, then we're not able to tell how many dimensions of the motion energy PCs actually drive the neural PCs. So in order to get a, a sense of the the dimensionality of the representation of behaviors in neural activity, we use something called reduced rank regression, which allows us to funnel our inputs through a, a low rank matrix, sort of a bottleneck here, rather than using a full dimensional, full rank regression matrix. And that, that means if we, for instance, if we use a rank one matrix to predict the neural PCs, then only one dimension of motion energy PCs can be used to project into one dimension of the neural PCs. And if we use a rank one model to predict the visual cortical activity from the behavior, you'll see that we're able to predict around 16% of the explainable variance in visual cortex with one predictor. And now we can start to increase the rank and see at what point does the prediction of visual cortex saturate and, and potentially when this prediction saturates tells us how many dimensions of, of behavior are represented in visual cortex. So we can start to increase the rank and we can see that around 16, this prediction uh, quality saturates. So adding more predictors after 16, increasing the rank of this prediction matrix doesn't improve the performance of our model. So this suggests that the, the behavioral representation in visual cortex is around 16 dimensional. Now let's visualize what this prediction looks like. So we can plot the neural activity using raster map. And so these neurons, again, are sorted so that neurons that are correlated to each other are put next to each other in this, in this raster plot. And then we can look at, for each of these neurons, we have a prediction given by our behavior, by our motion energy PCs. And this will give us a, a matrix, which is going to be, again, be neurons by time, but with these predictions instead of the neural traces. And what you can see is that the prediction from the behaviors does a good job of capturing kind of this global structure where many thousands of neurons are firing in similar ways. 
but it's also able to capture patterns of activity in, in slightly higher dimensions, such as groups of neurons of, of maybe 100 to 500 that are firing together, like these groups here. So, so this is just a way to visualize this idea that there's a multidimensional representation of behavior in visual cortex. Now, we want to know, is this representation of behavior constrained to visual cortex, or are other brain areas also representing the behavior of the mouse? So to answer this question, we, we looked at data collected by Nick Steinmetz. He used neuropixels probes, which are high-density electrodes, which have 384 sites each. And he puts eight of these probes into the brain simultaneously to, in order to record 3,000 neurons simultaneously at very high temporal resolution because these are electrophysiological recordings. So this is what the, the activity looks like on the left of, of a recording from eight of these probes uh, simultaneously. And you can see again, there, there, are lar there is this one dimension of variability that's spread across many thousands of neurons, but there's also some patterns of activity which only hundreds of neurons participate in. So there's this multidimensional brain-wide neural activity. Now let's try to explain it with the behavior. So I'm going to make the same plot I made on the previous slide, that where each neuron is replaced by its prediction that the behavior makes of, of what the neural activity should be. If, if it was explained by the behavior. And this is what the prediction looks like. And what you can see is that, again, the, the behavioral prediction of this whole brain activity captures this one-dimensional uh, uh, variability where lots of neurons are firing together. And it also is able to capture some of these finer scale structures where subgroups of neurons are firing together. So there are, again, multiple dimensions of very of of behavior represented in this neural activity. So we can make the, the plot we made on the previous slide again, but now break it down by brain areas and see how, the, how much of the explainable variance we can predict from behavior in different brain regions. And what you can see here is that thalamus, striatum, and frontal and sensory motor cortices, for instance, more uh, motor related areas potentially are are more well explained by behavior than visual retrospinal midbrain and hippocampus. And you can see the visual here, again, all these areas kind of a, fall under about a third of their explainable variants can be explained by behavior, which is consistent with the two photon results we got on the previous slide, where about a third was explained by the behavior. And then these other areas ha have a bit more of their variants explained by the behavior. So what What's going on in these different brain regions? One potential hypothesis might be that different brain regions are representing different behaviors. Like maybe thalamus is, is uh, very driven by running. It's representing running, the running signal. And then sensory motor cortex is representing whisking. So a simple way to try to visualize how uh, localized or spread out this, these behavioral representations are is we just colored these points along this embedding position by the, the color, these colors here, which represent the different brain areas. So here's the coloring based on this embedding position. And again, we've sorted these neurons so that correlated neurons are close to each other. So if neurons are close to each other in this embedding map in different brain regions, it means that they're correlated to each other across different brain regions. And now it's hard to see, obviously, because all there's lots of neurons here on top of each other. So we're going to expand out this axis so that you can start to see uh, where these neurons are in the brain. And we'll expand it by their depth in the brain. So thalamus is deep, is deeper here. And then you can see the hippocampus in blue and then, and then visual cortex up here in red. And what you can see in this plot is that there are lots of, of areas with red, lots of areas with light blue and with blue as well. And, and there's a lot of intermixing between these different brain regions. So it doesn't look like a single brain region is localized to a single, a single subsection of this, of this embedding graph. So what this suggests is that this 16-dimensional representation of behavior is, is projected across the entire brain. So every brain region knows what the mouse is doing up to this sort of 16-dimensional code reference. And now the big question is, what is this what are these behavioral representations used for? And that's an, that's an open question in the field that's currently being worked on. 
Somehow they might be integrated with sensory signals to, to perform decision making. Uh, they might be used for predictive coding. And this is, well, time will tell uh, what the what the act, what these behavioral representations are actually being used for in these different brain regions. All right. So there's these behavioral representations across the brain and in visual cortex. And are these are these behavioral representations interfering now with visual coding? I mean, visual cortex is also supposed to get inputs from from the the external sensory world. So are we still able to decode? accurately sensory stimuli from mouse visual cortex, visual stimuli from mouse visual cortex. And indeed we found that we could highly precisely decode visual stimuli from, from uh, visual cortex activity. But that's not to say that it was necessarily expected. So we have this noise from the behaviors, and we also have other noise in addition to that. So if we look at a single neuron, for instance, and its responses to multiple different stimuli, so in this case, these are different gratings across many different orientations, and each of these dots is the response of a neuron, or of this neuron to a given stimulus. And then this white curve here is the tuning curve fit to these responses. And you can see there's a lot of variability around this tuning curve. This is a partic this is a this is an example where the SNR is around 0.2, the signal to noise ratio. Uh, I can look at the best neuron in our 20,000 neuron recording. Here here it is, and now we have a sharper tuning curve, and you can see that the variability of the single trial responses to to these different oriented gratings is much less variable around this tuning curve. So, for instance, if this neuron is firing high then it's pretty, it's relatively likely that the stimulus is around 200 degrees because this is a low noise neuron. But most of the neurons in our population are not this low noise. Most of them have a signal to noise ratio around 0.2. And that's similar to this neuron here on the left rather than this neuron on the right. But fine, maybe that's okay. Maybe we can, we can average across all the neurons in our population. We have lots of neurons. In, in our recordings, and also mouse visual cortex has plenty of neurons. It has close to a million neurons. So maybe we can get the true stimulus and decode the true stimulus by averaging across neurons. And so you could, you could think that, um, that this type of averaging approach, which we we're calling an independent decoder, will perform well uh, in certain circumstances when we try to decode the, the neural app. The, the stimulus from the neural activity. So this independent decoder will perform well if all the noise in, in the neural responses is independent from each other, so it's uncorrelated. And also if any of the correlated noise that does exist is orthogonal to the stimulus space. So an example of orthogonal noise, which I am not going to show you that it's orthogonal in this talk, but it is, is noise due to these behavioral representations it drives a different subspace of neural activity than the stimulus subspace. So this type of correlated noise is not going to interfere with, with decoding just in this sort of averaging sense. The type of noise that would interfere would be correlated noise in the stimulus space. And if you have some correlated noise in the stimulus space, you can take care of it by using something like a linear decoder, where you have linear regression here, which ends up whitening your inputs, so removing those correlations. And then you use this, this whitened output, which in this case, we also put it through these super neurons in order to regularize our, our regression, um, give, can give you an accurate readout of what the stimulus is, even if there is some correlated noise in your system. So we go through both of these decoders in the paper, but in particular, I'm going to focus on the linear decoder here because we found that it performed better than the independent decoder. And so now let's see how well does this linear decoder perform and how accurately can we uh, recover the stimulus from the neural activity. So we're going to frame this as a discrimination task where the neurons have to tell us if the angle that we presented to the, the neurons is greater than 45 degrees. And, it, 
And what we found is if we look at the neural activity, that 75% of the time, if an angle, for instance, is 45.3 degrees, the mouse's neurons will say, yes, it's greater than, than 45 degrees. So just a difference of 0.3 degrees is discriminable in these neurons on 75% of trials. Uh, now this, I mean, this number might not mean much to you, but maybe if you look at these two angles, you can see that this is not a trivial task to do. And so this is a difference of, of two degrees. And that's the sort of difference where these angle, the, the neurons would get this right 100% of the time. So, and, and if, I, if I asked humans to do this task and they were trained on this task, they, they will do relatively well. They'll get around discrimination thresholds of one degree, but they still won't do as well as if I used all of the, uh, these 20,000 neurons in the mouse brain to do my decoding for me, to do this discrimination task for me. Now, what if we ask a mouse to do this discrimination task? Are they doing as well as humans? Are they doing as well as their neurons? And what other, other groups have found is that they do significantly worse than their neurons and, and humans do on this task. So they have discrimination thresholds of around 20 to 30 degrees. So that means that 75% of the time, the mouse will get this, is it greater than 45 degrees right? if the angle is around 65 degrees. So this is a much larger difference now that we're looking at than in the case of the neurons and human discriminators. So why is the behavior in the mouse so much worse than its neural activity? There are a few potential hypotheses, but we, we actually we think that we ruled some of them out. Um, so one hypothesis is that brain states are different when the mice are doing a task. Maybe they're excited, maybe they're anxious. Uh, but what we found in our recordings is that in terms of uh, modulation with arousal, such as running, if the mouse is running versus not running, we didn't see huge differences in discrimination performance. So it didn't seem that the brain state was modulating the decoding performance. Another hypothesis would be that maybe this information is locked away in V1 and it's not leaving primary visual cortex so the mouse doesn't have access to it when it's doing the task. So we recorded in V2 and higher visual areas in the mouse, and we found that this high, highly precise orientation information existed there as well. So it doesn't seem that the information isn't leaving V1. It's just where after it leaves V1, it, it definitely gets to V2. But then after that, how, how a downstream decoder is able to use that information, it, it seems that that's where this bottleneck is. Finally, we looked across different stimuli and thought maybe a difference in stimuli from our experiments versus other groups' experiments might explain some of this different, some of these differences in discrimination performance. Um, but it, when we showed many different types of stimuli, uh, short stimuli, small stimuli, drifting stimuli, uh, we didn't see large differences in the discrimination performance of the neurons in response to these different stimuli. So that doesn't seem to explain this discrepancy between neural performance and behavioral performance. So then why do mice have this accurate representation of orientation if they're not using it uh, to do discrimination tasks? Well, that's not necessarily what a mouse has evolved to do. They haven't evolved to do an orientation discrimination task, but maybe these really good angle calculations that visual cortex is doing are useful for other types of computations that are more ecologically relevant for a mouse. For instance, they might be using it to do depth perception or object tracking or object segmentation. All these different, um, all these different important uh, computations of the visual world rely on having an accurate uh, approximation of, the, of an angle that you're seeing in the visual world. So in summary, we found that mouse visual cortex is, high, is representing stimuli in a highly precise way, in particular oriented stimuli. We were able to decode the orientation highly precisely from visual cortical neurons. Now, this, this uh, leads to another question, which is, are mouse visual neurons encoding anything other than orientation? 
Is that the only thing that they care about? Are there interesting signals in this in these brain regions, or is visual cortical activity relatively low dimensional? Um, and what we found was that was not the case. Visual cortical activity in uh, in mice was in fact high dimensional, so it was coding many different uh, many different features of the visual world. And so now I'll I'll give you a bit of an overview of what we did to come to that conclusion and what the consequences are for coding. And the dimensionality of mouse visual cortical responses to images. We showed many, many thousands of natural images to the mice. And, and you can see the images in the upper left here. And then you can see the activity across these neurons. And you can see this, this strong change in activity when these images come into visual cortex. So now we are going to have this large matrix of 2,800 uh, 2, images by 10,000 neurons, and we're going to determine its dimensionality. And quickly I'll tell you why we might care about what the dimensionality of neural responses are. So the mouse visual cortical system is similar to the primate system in that the image, images come into the retina, they get transmitted to the thalamus, and then from the thalamus to the visual cortex, there's over 50 times expansion in the number of neurons representing the visual stimuli than there are in thalamus. So there's this expansion of the signal. And there's a couple of, of different reasons for this expansion. And that depends on what the dimensionality of the ultimate, uh, ultimately the activity is in visual cortex. So for instance, if from this expansion, thalamus sends the same visual stimuli feature to 100 neurons, and they represent, 100 neurons represent the same visual feature, then this would be a low dimensional code where many hundreds of neurons are representing the same thing. There's only a few different features represented. This is advantageous if you want to be robust to noise, for instance. If one of these neurons drops out, then there's another 99 or more neurons that are still representing this feature. So you have a reliable readout of your stimulus, uh, regardless of what happens but there is a disadvantage that you're representing fewer features with a low dimensional code. So a high dimensional code gives you the advantage of, have, of, of representing many different features in, in this neural space. So the, this expansion is, would be to have many more features represented in visual cortex than there are in thalamus, and potentially having all these features represented can make it easier for downstream decoders to do more complex tasks such as object recognition or object segmentation. So let's figure out whether it's high or low dimensional. So dimensionality we're going to define using the eigenvalues of the system. So we have this matrix, neurons by visual stimuli. We're going to take its eigenvalues, and I'll, I'll tell you what eigenvalues are now. Let's say we look at the top three we look at three of the neurons in this recording. These are these three axes here. Really, we, we have a 10,000 dimensional space. We can't visualize it here, but just pretend like we do. And now each of these dots is a response of these three neurons to a single visual stimulus. And the principal components of these responses are, are defined as the, the axes which have the, the most variance across these different stimuli. So the first principal component captures the the uh, captures the direction in the in these population responses which has the most variability across all these different stimuli and then pc2 captures the second most and pc3 captures the third most and the variance is the lengths of these principal components in this high dimensional neural space are defined as these eigenvalues and so you could have for instance a an eigenvalue spectrum that's what what these are called where five of your eigenvalues are positive and then the rest are zero. And this would be a case of a, a low dimensional system where only five of these PCs have significant variance. And you can use these five to explain all of these 10,000 neurons just with these five components. So you can kind of fit the, inf the information of the, of the system into these, these five components. Whereas if you had something like a flat eigen, eigenvalue spectrum where all of the variances are equal, then each of these PCs would have equal variance, and it would be like the neurons are, are all representing different directions in, in space. So 
I'll, I'll give you uh, concrete examples of, of these two different scenarios. So for instance, a low dimensional code with a one dimensional stimulus could be something like a bunch of these large uh, these large tuning curves where each of these neurons is, a, is one of these tuning curves different in different colors. And in this case, uh, this eigenspectrum only has two positive values, the rest are zero. This is a low dimensional code. And if we look at the random projection of, of this high dimensional space into three dimensions, then what we get is something that looks like a circle. So if we move in stimulus space a little bit, we're going to move smoothly in this, in this projection of this high dimensional space. And this makes sense because our tuning curves are quite broad. If you move a little bit in stimulus space, then the same neuron is likely to be firing. And then and there's just going to be small changes in these other neurons as they start to turn on. However, if you have something like a high dimensional code, you have each of these neurons. In this case, I, I've made this so that each neuron is one of these spikes. So they're each representing a different stimulus. They're each responding to a different stimulus. And in this case, then your, your eigenvalue spectrum is flat. Each neuron is, has equal variance and each one per, uh, has a different direction in this, this eigenvalue space. And then the 3D random projection of this data looks like a spiky ball. So if you move a little bit along this one dimensional axis, the representation completely changes. One neuron turns off and another turns on. And so you have something that if you move a little bit in this space, you're not going to be very robust in noise because you'll have a totally different representation. But you can potentially more precisely represent your stimuli than if your tuning curves are more broad. So what happens in the brain? Is it more like this system or like this system? So we looked at the eigenspectrum of neural responses, and what we found was that it was not exactly either of these. So it had look like this, where the variances decayed as 1 over n. And so that, for instance, the 10th principal component had a variance that was proportional to 1 over 10. The 100th principal component had variance proportional to 1 over 100, and so on. So this isn't a case where only a couple of eigenvalues are non-zero, like in a low-dimensional case. But this also isn't a case where all the eigenvalues are equal, like in this high dimensional case that where there's a sparse code for these stimuli. It's something sort of in between, where you are high dimensional, but, but we think that you're trying to trade off this high dimensionality while still trying to smoothly represent your stimuli, so that you're not in this case where you have this sort of spiky ball where you move a little bit in stimulus space and your representation completely changes. So the, the way to think, one way to think about it is that you have these lower, uh, these lower principal components, these, these first few principal components which have the most variance, and they kind of maintain uh, these, these kind, this kind of global uh, structure. And then you have higher principal components with less variance, but they can encode fine structure. But they're not sort of overwhelming your, your neural code with this fine structure so that you can still smoothly represent the, the stimulus space. So if we make a 1D model with a power law, this is what the projection would look, this is what a random projection would look like. So you can see that you can, you can move around this space and your neural representation of this one dimensional stimulus doesn't change that much, but you still kind of have these divots of, of where you're representing this sort of fine scale structure in, in the neural code. So in summary, we found that neural responses to visual stimuli are high dimensional. It's an open question as to what the stimulus encoding model is from, from stimuli to neural space. But we think that the fact that the neural eigenspectrum has this 1 over n decay suggests that the, this transformation of stimulus to neural space uh, is constrained in some ways to potentially be more smooth. And just to, to wrap up the entire talk, um, using these large scale recordings, we've, we've been able to come, we've been able to find new things scientifically that we weren't able to find using smaller scale recordings or recordings with less uh, resolution. 
for instance, we found that these spontaneous behaviors are driving multidimensional brainwide activity. Uh, it's unknown what they're used for, but but we we at least have started to characterize them. Uh, we found that visual responses are highly precise. We can very accurately decode the stimulus that the mouse is seeing using its neurons. And finally, we found that neural responses to visual stimuli are, are high dimensional. So there's a lot of information in mouse visual cortex. And now it, the question is what it's using it for and, and how it's using it to, to sort of guide behavior. So all of the data that I presented today is available on Figshare. All of the code uh, used to create the figures in the paper and to run the analyses is, is on GitHub as well. And just to show you a comparison, this is the size of a mouse brain versus a human brain. So it's much smaller, but there's still a lot going on in this brain, this little brain that we don't understand. Um, and it's a, an exciting time to be working on this because we now have access to these really large scale recordings and and it's an open field in terms of how to analyze this data and how to uh, figure out the true structure of, of neural activity. This is just, I, I feel like, the, the start of all of this. And I'd like to thank my advisors, Marius Pakitsariu and Kenneth Harris, and also all the collaborators I've had at UCL and at, at Genelia. And finally, I'd just like to say that I'm opening my lab in a couple weeks at Genelia, and I'm looking for students and postdocs who are interested in, in working on computational neuroscience problems, uh, sort of like the ones that I presented today. If you're interested in any of that work, you please contact me. We can start work remotely as well, given the circumstances. Thank you.